Welcome to the Treasury Update podcast presented by Strategic Treasure, your source for interesting treasury news, analysis, and insights in your car, at the gym, or wherever you decide to tune in. There are numerous events disrupting treasury and payment processes. On this episode of the Seismic Shifts in Corporate Treasury series, host Craig Jeffrey talks with MUFG's VP and Senior Product Manager of Real-Time Payments, Jennifer Stanley, and Manager of Product Management Development Group, Sachin Thacker, on faster payments. They explore key payment process pain points, examine the new payment scheme landscape, and then look at how these changes are transformative through a business-to-consumer case study with real-time payments. Listen in to the discussion. Welcome to the Treasury Update podcast. Let me introduce the company and guests that are on with me. Uh, MUFG is a $2.8 trillion in assets bank. This makes MUFG the fifth largest bank in the world. MUFG is also an AFP Pinnacle sponsor at the 2019 AFP event. I'm here with Jennifer Stanley. She's a vice president and senior product manager for RTP at MUFG. She has over 20 years of experience in the financial services industry focusing on payments. She has worked at MasterCard, J.P. Morgan Chase, BNY Mellon, and HSBC in different payment product management capacities. Currently, she is the VP, Senior Product Manager for Real-Time Payments for MUFG Union Bank. Jennifer holds a master's degree in international economics from Johns Hopkins and a bachelor's degree from Stanford. Sachin Tucker is a director, unit manager in the product management and development group at MUFG. He is responsible for product development and innovation, product profitability, and oversight of product risk and compliance for products that including USD clearing, FX payments, ACH, real-time payments, check disbursement, and fraud prevention services. He is the co-chair of the Wires Payment Systems Working Group for MUFG Union Bank and an active member of several industry groups such as BAFT, the Payments Committee, and the SWIFT U.S. Cash and trade subcommittee, as well as the real-time business committee. Sachin has over a decade of experience in financial services and technology industry. Jennifer, Sachin, welcome. Thank you. Thank you. So let's begin with an overview. There is much talk and action on faster payment schemes across the globe. It seems every country has activity and regions do as well. And it is a much more broad approach than just covering speed in terms of faster. Uh, It's about making better payments, which requires solving far more than just the timing challenges of payments. Before we dive into the details of various faster payment initiatives, I think we should explore how we got to this point. This means we need to identify some of the triggers for these projects. So let's do an inventory of some of the recurring pain points or issues, perhaps with a separate lens for business-to-consumer payments, and business-to-business payments. So let's start with business-to-business. Let me just ask both of you, whoever would like to start off, maybe Jennifer, you could start. What are some of the top pain points that you see? In the business-to-business space, I would say the top pain point with payments is reconciling the payment on the back end. This can be particularly difficult if an invoice has been renegotiated or has changed or if there have been different trade terms that have just dictated a different price for the payments to be made. Okay, so that's number one, reconciliation, making sure that they can track it to their original system, especially if there's any differences. Thank you. Uh, Sachin, do you have any business-to-business pain points you wanted to bring up as well? Yeah, I think in terms of all the pain points, and if I want to just categorize into a few bullet points, if you will, because it's it's we have there are numerous pain points that industry faces today in terms of even business to business payments, cost being the one key driver. I mean, we just don't know the, or businesses don't know what their cost is going to be, if you will, when they make a payment, especially cross border rails, right? They just can't predict what the beneficiary is going to get. Lack of transparency. The businesses do not know in terms of where the payment is. Sometimes when the payment does not happen um, near real time, it takes weeks. If the payment has a problem, it takes weeks, maybe even two weeks, 
to even get the whole payment flow completed. And that's just not acceptable. Uncertainty, uh, nobody knows or gets notification when the payment is delivered uh, in terms of the payer or the receiver, if you will. And data issues, especially with business to business, that's big. As Jennifer mentioned, reconciliation. If the data gets dropped when it goes from one bank to another, uh, and we have maybe at least three or four banks in a, in a, in a chain, especially for cross-border, that becomes challenging. Uh, reconciliation becomes a nightmare if the uh, right payment details data is not transferred over. And those are the key pain points that most of the business to business payments have been having for years now. I would like to add that that's not happening for all payments. But even when you look at the percentage wise, any payment, even if it's one person, that slows down the business and creates nightmare for them. Uh, there's a range of good points there. This uh, something that gets slowed down creates an exception process or if the amount's different on the receiving side, um, you know, via Jennifer's uh, reconciliation example, it creates an exception or a defect and that uh, adds cost, frustration, and time to the equation. So those are uh, quite interesting. I liked uh, the example, too, of information being dropped as it moves along, making it harder to, you know, for the receiving party to know what was being paid, when, or why there was an adjustment. So those are some, some really good points. Excellent. So that covers a lot of the business-to-business -business side of the pain points for payments. Now, as we shift over to business to consumer, obviously business to consumer has been pushing payments along. There's a faster expectation, more frequency, uh, you know, being able to handle payments on a consumer to consumer basis. Uh, and so that drives the business to consumer model and, and to some extent informs the expectations on the business to business side. But thinking about the business to consumer uh, front, what are, the, what are some of the pain points you see here, uh, Jennifer? I would say the main pain points that exist in the business to consumer space is that there's a gap between the expectations the consumers have these days and what businesses can bring to them in terms of payment speed and payment data. And uh, while a number of consumers are expecting their payments to come faster uh, due to faster technology and uh, greater expectations in the marketplace, businesses are still writing checks, frankly. That's, that doesn't jive with their view of what should be happening in today's world. <laughs> so if you can send a, a payment to uh, your babysitter or to someone else for lunch in a matter of seconds, that's the expectation, not uh, I'm going to send a check, it takes three days for the mail, and then I've got to scan it on my phone. It just is a, a massive gap. Okay. Are there more uh, gaps than that? Yeah, I think in terms of the B2C or even from C to B perspective, right, I think when it comes to consumers, the whole expectation changes. Um, I mean, for them, making a payment itself is a pain point. I mean, we need to think about in a consumer industry where we need to take the whole making a payment process out of the, the services and the serve, whatever services they are subscribing. And if payment happens as part of the subscription of the service seamlessly, that that will be ideal. The fact that if you have, if I have to go do a process to subscribe a service and then do a make separate process to make a payment, I mean that's something consumers don't like. It has to be totally seamless. And I think Uber model is a very perfect example. You get into a car, you go to a from point A to point B, you get out of the car. All the consumer has to do is basically define from point A to point B. They don't have to follow a separate process to make a payment. And that's a very good example. And any other uh, market segment, if you will, or, or business model that's going to adopt making payments seamless for the services offered, that's, that will be the, the key driver. I think that's a good point. You know, that example of uh, getting in and out of a cab and you have to fight to, to select the payment method with the cab driver. You might get a receipt that's the size of your thumb and you have to stick it in your pocket when you're jumping out of the, the cab. Uh, I don't think anybody misses that type of experience. It was painful, but like you said, it becomes part of it and then you get a receipt emailed to you, which is perfect for work. You don't have to say, hmm, what does this one relate to? Where did I go? How did I move from point A to point B? Uh, was that business or, or personal? You could see exactly the starting point. 
And I think it's, I think you bring up a good point using that ride share example. At the most recent uh, AFP, uh, the winner was a ride share company. And one of the elements that was great was supporting this gig economy. People can take their payments not just once a day, not just once a week, but once a day, or I think four times a day. You could hit the app and get money transferred to your account up to four times a day if you really needed it. So it just made it so that it was a, a feature, um, not uh, some activity. I think I'd like to ask Sachin uh, for you to take uh, the lead on giving us a landscape overview of the faster payment schemes or uh, maybe even better payment schemes. Give us a quick overview. There's too many to cover all of them, but hit, hit a few of the highlights for us. From landscape perspective in U.S. domestic market itself, we have so many options available. We have Venmo, we have Zill, we have the real-time payments from Clearing House, we have Visa and MasterCard offering their own rails or fast payment methods. And this week itself, uh, we have Fed announcing their, their own faster payment and settlement rail, which is what they're calling as Fed now. So there are so many options available. But we need to really take a step back and understand what what do we really mean by faster payment? And what are the problems that we are really trying to solve for? Because speed is not the only problem that this industry really wants to solve. And then evaluate which are the ones that are really going to survive in the long run, if you will. I think from for me, a faster payment definition is speed, interoperability, certainty, 24 by 7 availability, and most important, provide capability to third party to offer innovative services. I think for me, a faster payment rail is the one that is going to help us innovate in the future. For now, it's more about getting the rails laid out. But if any faster payment rail that is going to help innovate and provide value added services to innovate, to take the whole friction of making a payment go away, for me, that's a faster payment. From that aspect, UK real-time payment and the real-time payment from Clearing House, these are the two main ones that stand out. Obviously, have we have multiples of real-time payments globally, but I'll just stick to the Clearing House RTP and UK real-time payment. Both offers real-time payments, speed. UK real-time payment is also moving towards ISO 20022, so there will be interoperability. I mean, in future, I can send a payment from US to UK, if you will, if that becomes possible. Uh, there will be interoperability, and I'll get confirmation certainty within seconds, and both have efforts going on to provide value-added services on top of real-time payments. For me, that's a key. So uh, interoperability, certainty, speed, and you also mentioned the ability for third parties to leverage these payment uh, systems. Did I get that right? Yes. It's basically, that's how you will take out the friction of making payments when you are able to allow third parties to innovate and use the rails and provide services to the end users, either be consumers, businesses, and both the rails are moving towards that direction. Yeah. Now, you you said something. This may be too much for this particular podcast. You talked about uh, interoperability, and you discussed a format, the ISO 20022. Now, when you think about, let's say, a payment going from the UK to the US, there's a format requirement that has to be delivered um, across uh, the border uh, between two different uh, messaging platforms. Um, there's also rules for how things settle. What does interoperability look like? How far are we away from that? Well, I think the good thing is most of the faster payments globally are riding a common messaging protocol, which is ISO 20022. UK real-time payments is currently not on ISO 2022, but they have concrete plans to move to ISO 2022 in next two to three years, which is great news. And Again, from timeline perspective, when all these real-time payments globally potentially will even talk to each other, that's a difficult one to predict because it's not just the, the interoperability at that point in time. 
it's also the cross border rules regulations and you know there are in country laws that may come in so i expect maybe the g7 countries maybe even the developed countries like us uk maybe even australia canada their faster payments might start interacting with each other in the next 5 years or at least i have a i i wish they do so that basically takes the whole friction out of cross border payments at least from consumer to consumer perspective or remittance perspective uh, but if if that will happen with every other country may not be may not be because of the in country domestic rules and regulations yeah and i know you uh both of you spend so much time uh, thinking about payments uh, dropping them into uh products that that work for your customers uh, but uh, but thinking ahead i think helps those of us who do a lot with payments but may not spend all our time there with the landscape covered such and i want to turn back to jennifer um, and move to a case study and part of that jennifer is for real-time payments maybe you could begin and explain what real-time payments is how it originated um, is this something that uses existing payment rails or new rails that's a, a key term and then who runs that sure Uh, I would say real-time payments, or RTP, is definitely the first major development in the U.S. payments infrastructure in over 40 years. But at the same time, the entire market, and I'm talking about financial institutions, consumers, and corporates, they've all been itching for this. So first of all, RTP in some form or another is already alive in 25 countries worldwide. Japan has actually had their Zengen system since 1973. And as Sachin mentioned, the U.K., introduced their faster payment system in 2008. What's different in the U.S. is that while the appetite for real-time payments and the infrastructure to support it have been simmering for years, it was only in 2016 that the Federal Reserve took steps to recommend the development of a net new, real-time, ubiquitous payment system to be offered through the banking system. Accordingly, first the Clearinghouse began development of the RTP system using Vocalink technology. In November 2017, the first RTP was sent. Since then, increasing numbers of banks have linked up to the RTP network, and today over 50% of DDAs in the U.S. are alive and capable of receiving real-time payments. As Sachin also mentioned, the Fed has now jumped into the fray. They're introducing their FedNow system, which will also serve the U.S. banks with an alternate real-time payment rail. I'm not going to go through all the advantages and features of RTP, but the unique data characteristics of the ISO 20022 protocol and the always-on and immediately available qualities of RTP payments lend themselves to alleviation of a host of friction points in today's payment processes. Jennifer, you brought up a couple couple points here, and I thought it might be useful to just go into them for just a moment, just a slight discursus. You mentioned the Fed provided some ground rules for net new RTP, and then you talked about the clearinghouse. And so the clearinghouse is not the Fed, and Fed now is, is different. Maybe you could just explain the clearinghouse and Fed now just real briefly. The Federal Reserve, as most people know, is, is the basis of our banking system here in the U.S., um, and all banks in the U.S. are members of the Fed. The clearinghouse, however, is a consortium of 25 uh, lar- larger size banks uh, that work together to, do, to clear payments in the ACH, wire, and uh, now RTP space. And so it's an, an alternate clearing mechanism, but an equally viable one, and one that, that's uh, been instrumental in driving innovation in the United States. Yeah, that's, that's interesting. I think it's, um, you know, as I've looked at payment systems in different countries, it seems that the U.S. is the only one that seems to have a an alternate for clearing checks for ACH for wires and now for real time payments. That uh, I don't see that in other countries. I don't know if you see that other places, but this cooperative or you said a consortium of banks can run uh, this type of payment platform, and the central bank or the Federal Reserve runs a platform that seems to be pretty unique globally. I would say this has to do mostly with the, the size and the breadth of the United States financial institutions. There are over 5,000 banks in the United States. And then on top of that, there are a number of, of course, credit unions and smaller banks. 
And between those two groups, you really have a lot of differing needs and requirements in the payment system world. Sachin, did you have anything you wanted to add to Jennifer's comments about the the two different organizations that run payment rails? No, I think I agree with with Jennifer. I mean, it's it has to do with the, the the number of banks that operate in the United States alone. I mean, there are almost close to nine thousand um, banks and credit unions combined that participate in Fed network, and I think it is key in terms of what the clearing house provides as a services, um, if you will, for for major banks. You know, as we look at uh, a case study that might have a business to consumer flavor. I'd like uh, you to help us understand how something like real-time payments helps solve more than just a delay or a timing issue. We talked about speed is not all there is. Uh, There's other issues that have to be solved. So maybe you could give us some example for a case study. Sure. Again, I'm going to concentrate on the insurance industry, and I'll use a B2C example and talk about insurance policy funds drawdown. And in this scenario, a policyholder plans on drawing funds from his whole life insurance policy after retirement. And at this time, the insurance company sends his monthly annuity payments to him through RTP. As a result, the policyholder receives his payment on a monthly basis immediately and straight into his account. There's no check to wait for and to deposit. And the insurance company on their side is able to reduce costs and time normally associated with using checks for payouts. In addition, any information about the policy itself can be included with the payment, and that's very helpful not only for the insurance company in in understanding what they're paying for, but also for the recipient in understanding what they're receiving. I I mean, that that sounds great because it's it's faster, it's easier, you don't have to run to the bank. Uh, But when you say there's information on the policy itself that comes along with it, what type of information can be sent with uh, the RTP, the value transfer? Well, with the breadth of uh, ISO 2022, really anything. So, of course, the policy number, the, the length of the term might need to be brought up. Any discounts from the payment for any reason can be also called out. Any information that's relevant to the payments being made can be included with that payment, and it becomes much more easy to understand what and why you're being paid the amount you are. The policy number, the length of payment, all this information that relates to the payment can be sent along, uh, and then the consumer might be able to read it uh, at some point or as soon as their bank makes that available. It could include here's an 800 number to call or a website if they have questions. Um, this is the kind of enriched information that could be passed along with the, uh, the payment info? Exactly. And moreover, if the insurance company wanted to include marketing information, additional services, as you mentioned, a, a link to a website to where they could get more information, all that could be included with that payment. And it, it becomes an easy vehicle for the company to communicate to its policyholders. Right. Rather than being limited to 80 characters with a PPD plus or something, there would be much more information that could be shared is what I, what I hear you saying. Correct. Yeah, certainly there would be uh, ways to communicate. Anything else that would be uh, transformative uh, to business-to-consumer or business-to-business payment Um, whether you use a particular industry vertical like insurance or... Well, I wanted to talk a little bit about B2B just because that's always the holy grail of what payments are trying to achieve in this world. And I want to talk specifically about vendor payments. So this example could apply to any industry, but in this case, I'm going to take the example of a bakery that orders specialty breads from a vendor. Uh, In this case, the vendor requests payment upon delivery of 100 loaves of bread by sending what's called an RFP or request for payment. In this RFP, they specify the invoice number, the PO, the type of bread, again, whatever information they want to put in there. And the bakery counters with a message that actually 20 loads have arrived stale and they're only going to pay for 80. The RFP then is re- reissued with a modified number of loads delivered and a modified amount to pay. 
The bakery responds with a payment that is reconciled immediately, deposited straight into the Avengers account, and is cleared and ready for further use immediately. <laughs> so, so this is a, a way of using the same rail for dispute resolution, in a sense, or reconciliation of uh, differences in what was shipped or what was shipped and received in good order. Yes. That is excellent. So how far away are we from that type of enriched payment and communication experience? Well, a lot of it is based on adoption. And again, 51% of U.S. accounts are able to receive an RTP. Fewer number are able to send an RTP. So we're waiting for more adoption on that side. The other point of adoption, of course, is the use of an RFP or request for payment. And that's really what's going to change the way payments are made and requested, I think, in the future. And we can look a lot at uh, bill pay examples, too, in this case. But I think that once RFP becomes a norm of the payment industry, uh, it will fundamentally change how payments are made, both on the B2C and B2B sides. So instead of sending an invoice today, that invoice may, or the invoice, invoice information may be included in the RFP or the request for payment? says, here's what uh, we shipped and here's the information, or how would that work? That's correct. That is correct. And then it can be renegotiated. You can have dynamic discounting. You could have a a host of other services involved with the ability to send an RFP immediately and have it responded to accordingly. On the example that Jennifer mentioned, if you think about it in this whole end-to-end flow from B2B payments perspective, In today's world, we have the whole account payables process, a payment process, and account receivable process. If you think about it, these are three separate distinct processes that are followed today. With request for payment, you're combining them into and making them seamless. So the whole automation happens around accounts payments process the actual payment flow itself, and account receivables, and the reconciliation on both sides. It just becomes part of that payment workflow, if you will. And that takes the whole friction and the inefficiencies from today's world, if you will. And that's that's the that's the value add, if you will, from RFP. So this, this uh, pipeline is really a uh, short-circuiting our way to straight-through processing for you know, invoicing, uh, negotiation, payment, settlement. Uh. Yeah, and it's not just in domestic. I mean, even Swift is working on a RFP service capability. Obviously, the adoption will take time. But again, this is just going to change in uh, the whole landscape for B2B payments in the future. I hope we can talk about this subject in more depth uh, in the relatively near future on um, on the request for payment side. That That's a major change in... You know, it's what we heard back in the EDI world, passing data back and forth. It's uh, uh, and the the adoption of of better technology for ERP systems, accounting systems, treasury systems. I think holds a lot of promise there. As we shift now to to the final thought section, are there any other changes coming that will be as highly transformative in the next few years as some of the examples that you gave, or what should we watch out for? Or finally, what advice do you have for corporate payment professionals? And let's let's go Jennifer and then Sachin. Well, I wanted to say a few words about Zelle because Zelle hasn't been discussed here and Zelle has been a, a great success story in the real-time payment space. Uh, although Zelle is not officially a real-time payment yet, um, if, if you've made a Zelle payment, you'll notice that it actually does not come into you, the payers accounts, payees accounts until several hours afterwards. But what we're going to find, I think, coming up in a few months or so is the integration of Zelle and RTP. That is to say that Zelle will ride on the RTP rail so that it will truly become a real-time payment. And in turn, RTP will take a lot of the strengths that Zelle brings to the table, most notably a directory of uh, names identified and account numbers identified by uh, cell phone numbers or email addresses and use them in tandem to really make a very robust P2P service. 
which can in turn can be used for business to consumer as well. Excellent. I'm just trying to think about how we would understand that key sentence you said that Zell will ride on the rails of RTP. Um, I think five years ago, we wouldn't have understood hardly anything of what that sentence means and what it means today is pretty, uh, pretty powerful. Yeah, I mean, totally agreed. I mean, uh, the example that Jennifer mentioned, I mean, for me, real-time payments are the first step towards a new world of payments. And as Jennifer mentioned or gave example about alias payments, nobody wants to share their bank accounts and providing aliases, like just think about it. A decade ago, we would have never thought that I could just provide a, my cell phone as a mode of payment or cell phone number as a mode of payment instead of an account number. That's what the future looks like in the, uh, if you will. And not just email IDs or cell phone numbers, you have QR codes. Now QR codes are out there for longest time, but we have already seen this happening in Asia, mainly in China and India, where they are just changing the way the payments are made or faster payments are made, if you will. You don't really have to provide your bank account number anymore. You walk in a Delhi store, you just scan your app, you scan the QR code, and boom, the payment happens. The alternate ID mechanism of making a payment is, is, is the innovation that is happening on top of faster payment rails, which is the key. So again, it, we need to have a framework that provides the speed, the, the certainty, and the innovation capability. And services or applications like Zelle will basically then be able to leverage the true real-time payments rail. Uh, we, in Europe itself, we have supermarkets now offering solutions on top of real-time payments rails, if you will, where I can just walk into a supermarket with an app on my phone, scan everything that I need, and walk out. The payment happens instantaneously. And the benefit of that is now supermarkets can basically do a targeted marketing towards or offers or push out offers towards the end consumers. I mean, you all remember we received those hefty booklets of discounts in mails. We don't even know what those are and half the times we don't even use them. Now, all of a sudden the supermarkets then can do like, okay, I'm, these are the brands that I or goods that are normally frequently buy. Maybe I should target him with some discounts and, and bring him to my store more often. And so these are the things that faster payments, it's not just a faster payment, it's a capability to innovate on top of faster payment is what going to be the future uh, ecosystem for payments, if you will. Thank you, Sachin and Jennifer, for your comments and thoughts on this episode of Seismic Shifts, Better Payments. Uh, there are some other assets or resources that you as a listener may want to uh, take advantage of. Uh, the AFP Payments Guide is sponsored or underwritten by MUFG, and the current version is on API, and you can go to the AFP website. This does require a membership, an online membership to access, but some really good material there. So again, uh, thank you, Jennifer. Thank you, Sachin. You've reached the end of another episode of the Treasury Update podcast. Be sure to follow Strategic Treasurer on LinkedIn. Just search for Strategic Treasurer. This podcast is provided for informational purposes only, and statements made by Strategic Treasurer LLC on this podcast are not intended as legal, business, consulting, or tax advice. For more information, visit and bookmark strategictreasurer.com.